Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret, and I am indeed the Director of Protocols, Algorithms, and Libraries. And I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about the work being done really by a team, a huge team of cryptographers, leaders, developers. Um, and we all work together because we're obsessed with privacy of data. We, it's our main mission is to make sure your data is protected and private at all times. Today, I'm going to talk about four of the team's efforts. One is post-quantum cryptography. Uh, you he hear about that in the news, exciting stuff, PQ. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means and a little, and a little more about what we're doing about it. Cryptographic computing is another topic. It's uh, an exciting topic where we think about protecting data while it's in use. Um, I'll talk a lot more about that, but it's a new field where you can actually operate and get insights out of data while the data is encrypted. The, fourth, the third thing I'm going to talk about is actually our cryptographic library, AWS LibCrypto, and our commitment to making sure this library is optimized for the environment and always has FIPS. Now I'll talk about what FIPS is. And then the fourth thing is our transport layer security efforts. Uh, we do a lot of work in transport layer security, and we have a brand new offering called S2N Quick. OK, let's start with the easy one, post-quantum cryptography. A lot of you have probably heard about quantum cryptography in the, in the news. And this is me trying to explain quantum cryptography and actually quantum computers just enough for you to sort of get a feel for what's going on here what it means to cryptography, and how we're going to actually plan for the future. Unfortunately, we have to start with this. What's a bit? OK, right now, traditional computers have always acted on bits. And this picture is trying to display to you what does it mean to do three bits worth of work. And what it means is you had to do two to the three or eight things. So to represent three bits of work, you had to count all the way to update one, two, three. You looked at all those states. And if you wanted to represent two to the 30 possibilities, you'd have that enormous number there. And the beauty of the qubit is that it really can't decide what it wants to be, a zero or a one. So qubits are always kind of in a state of fluctuation. So in order to represent these eight states, I only need three qubits. Or to represent that huge number's worth of states, I need 30 qubits. This isn't quite true, because qubits are noisy right now. They're not pure. So we need a few more qubits to make sure that we really represent the 30 states to kind of compensate for errors where qubits get a little confused. What's cool about qubits? Qubits are gathered together, and I'm going to call it a bin. So we sort of put a bunch of qubits together in a bin, and they're in there thinking, am I a 0, am I a 1? I'm not really sure. And then we apply something called an algorithm to it. And that algorithm essentially kind of lets the qubits think about the algorithm together. And they reinforce one another until they've all tended towards one direction or the other. So if you see that, they all decided yes. In the beginning, they were hanging around, no, yes, I'm not sure. But in the end, once we applied the algorithm, they reinforced one another, and the right answer stood out. So this is a great technique for certain kinds of problems. And it's no good at all for other kinds of problems. Sorting, for example. You're not going to sort with qubits. But if you want to know the best possible answer, frequently there's an algorithm where you can use qubits, and you can figure it out with qubits. So what's happening right now is you've got a bunch of physicists, and they're all trying to fit as many qubits as humanly possible into a bin. Because the more qubits, the more states they can exhaust over and the more problems they can solve. 
I'm not a physicist, so I don't know how this works. But I do know that they're currently trying to corral them, but we still don't really have enough qubits together in a bin to do anything that a traditional computer couldn't do right now. But we are gradually getting a larger and larger number of qubits in the bin. We're in the hundreds now. We started at like three. And over the last 10 years, we've gotten up to a couple hundred qubits. That's a lot of qubits. But we're still a long ways to go before we're really getting some real value out of it. And here's where the kicker is. If you have a quantum computer with enough qubits, some of our cryptographic algorithms will not be good anymore. And those in particular are things like RSA and elliptic curves. These are the key exchange and signature algorithms that are going to be impacted by a future possible quantum computer. We really don't know. There, there may be a theoretical limit to the number of qubits. I had a friend who used to say, I'm pretty sure once we get enough qubits together to do a 2048-bit RSA and we take the plug and we plug it in, then you know, the power is just going to go hmm. So I don't know, but you might. And it's up to the physicists to decide if they can get enough qubits working together. But if they do, this is the algorithm impact. So it's important to understand certain algorithms are fine. AES, which is the workhorse encryption algorithm of the internet, is basically fine. If you're using 128-bit AES, you should probably go to 256. But that's it. That's the whole sum total of the impact on AES, is I need a slightly bigger key size. Same for hashing. The SHA series of, of hashing, SHA 1's bad anyway, SHA 2 and SHA 3, are still going to be fine. You just want to move away again from the 256-bit strength up to the 384 and the 512-bit strength. But where we get in trouble are the key exchange algorithms and the signature algorithms, which is where fun public key cryptography based on things like the factoring problem or the elliptic curve problem, those are all in trouble with enough bits in a quantum, enough qubits in a quantum computer. And so those are the ones we have to think about right now to determine what our future will be if enough qubits start to look threatening. So NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a US government organization, and it is an organization that frequently holds what's called algorithm competitions. And these competitions actually resulted in AES, for example. They took all kinds of uh, different suggestions from all over the world, and one of them, was selected after many years of testing and research to be AES, the encryption standard, which was for the US government, but many, many, many other governments and many, many other, just everybody uses AES. So NIST realized that PQ is a problem. And so they said to themselves, we better run another competition. So they've been running a post-quantum competition to replace the key exchange mechanisms and the signature mechanisms. And just recently, I didn't update the slides for this, they've actually announced some finalists. So we have three signature algorithm finalists and one key exchange finalist. All right, one thing I want to talk about here is what does it mean um, for you today? Because there's a little threat to you today that you at least need to understand. And what we're doing now with all of our data is we're sending it usually in a client-server relationship, usually with TLS, Transport Layer Security. Um, and it's going to be encrypted with AES, and it's going to be hashed with SHA. But it's also going to, the key that we use between the client and server is established with either RSA or elliptic curves. And it may be signed with either RSA or an elliptic curve signature algorithm. And as that data is transiting across the internet, an adversary who was sufficiently motivated and curious could record that data today. 
And then that adversary would have to store that recorded data and basically sit and wait for the day that that adversary believes they'll have a quantum capability. And if they ever have that quantum capability, they can decrypt the data that's being sent today. So it's kind of a lot of ifs, but there is a bit of a threat here. If you have some really, really, say, 50-year sensitive data, we don't know what the world's going to be like in 50 years or how many qubits are going to be in a bin. Another threat people think about today is actually signatures and long-term trust. I have a picture of a car here because cars are things people buy that they keep for a really long time. I keep my cars until they fall apart, and I did just buy a new one, a brand new car. So it came from the manufacturer with a built-in root of trust for updates so that my car gets updates from the manufacturer. And those updates are signed so that we can believe they're from the manufacturer. And I like it that my car checks to see that those updates are the, from the manufacturer before they actually apply them. But suppose I'm, my car lasts 30 years. It's possible the signature algorithm they're using for those updates can be broken in the 30-year future by a quantum computer. And if that happens, someone can say something, although my car is probably 30 and not in that great a shape anyway, but someone could say something to the car, pretending to be the manufacturer and break the car. So right now, people are thinking about ways to either make sure they can update the signature algorithm that's in their cars so that someday, when the future looks a little clearer, and maybe it makes sense to be a little more worried, they can update that algorithm to one of the NIST-approved algorithms. And it's possible, now that NIST has selected a few, that we can actually start moving on that now. So what are we doing? What is AWS doing to prepare for this future? We've been working on this for years. We have people who've been submitting algorithms to the NIST competition. We have actually owned the chair of the ETSI, that's the European, Telecom the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, um, who's working with them on hybrid key exchanges. Brief break, what's a hybrid key exchange? Well, for now, we have regular key exchanges that we've been using for years and years to protect data. We don't want to get rid of those. We're just going to enhance them by adding a public key exchange on top of it and using both of those. So you have traditional security plus post-quantum security. And we've been working on the protocol standards, like SSH, TLS 1.3, certificate standards, all to make sure that we are ready to deploy post-quantum algorithms and libraries. And the last thing, S2N TLS, we have post-quantum in S2N TLS. We have post-quantum in AWS LibCrypto. So these are things that are available now for people to try out and take for a test spin. And there you go. That'll let you uh, give you the description on how to try out our implemented PQ cryptography using S2N TLS. And we have just released a blog. So a brand new blog on post-quantum. And it also tells you all about our thoughts on post-quantum, what we've been doing on post-quantum, and gives you some pointers as to how to take out and try our implemented post-quantum crypto. OK, next topic, cryptographic computing. This is a fun picture. Essentially, we've always been protecting data in transit using something like TLS so that when a client and a server are having a conversation that's all encrypted and authenticated using algorithms like RSA and ECC today, using PQ algorithms tomorrow. When we put data to a hard drive, we encrypt that, so it's encrypted at rest, using AES, as we discussed. But in general, when you want to use the data, you have to decrypt the data. 
And so to use the data in, gen in general, what we do is we put them in an enclave where we can protect that data with access control, where we're sure that we've got all the protections that we can have on that enclave. But the cryptographic computing question is what if? What if you never had to decrypt that data? What if the customer could actually encrypt the data with a key they controlled before it ever left their premises and send it to AWS? And AWS would not have or need that key that was encrypting the data, but AWS could still help provide value from the data. There's all kinds of use cases for this. Healthcare, people who have a lot of, say, sensitive data about heart attacks from lots of different hospitals want to be able to collaborate, to learn more about care, to learn more about what causes things. But that data is incredibly sensitive, very private data. Financial services, I'm going to go through an example talking about banks and fraud. Ad technology, I will go through a nice example where there's two people, an advertiser and a publisher of ads, who both have information and don't want to share that information with anybody, but do want to receive some value from the intersection of that data. And law enforcement is a nice, easy to understand example. There's a do not fly list. And there's an airline that needs to know, are you on the do not fly list? The airline doesn't want to release everybody on, all the names of everybody on the plane to the government, and the law enforcement doesn't want to release the names of everybody on the do not fly list to the air, airline. But you still want to know, is somebody on the do not fly list before you let them on the plane? One of the technologies we use to achieve this is called private set intersection, and here's the example that I wanted to talk through. You've got an advertiser who has a bunch of customers who buy stuff. And that advertiser, since they're selling this, this item to those customers, knows how much they spent. You have the ad publisher who's got a bunch of people that they show ads to. And they track the clicking behavior of these individuals. And so they have a little chart in their head that says, hey, these are a bunch of individuals, and I know what, what they, what, did I show them this ad, and did they click on it? Neither one of them wants to share that data set with the other one. But the advertiser would love to know, hey, I paid for this ad, what I get out of it? By both of them encrypting the data with a key they control before they send it to AWS. AWS can actually perform what's called private set intersection on that data and determine that five out of eight people who saw an ad purchased the product. So they've got some idea now, hey, this is what my ad did. And we can, they can also, AWS can also determine on average people who saw an ad spent more than people who didn't see an ad. AWS never sees any of this data, but they're able to perform that intersection activity and provide those two pieces of information back to the advertiser. This is more complicated. Privacy preserving federated learning is essentially first you have to understand machine learning and federated machine learning. So I will sort of explain it, which is there's a server with a global model that they've got by training it on data that they've seen over, say, the years. And here we're thinking of bank fraud data. So banks collaborate when it comes to finding fraud because they're all interested in tracking and catching fraud. So there's a giant global data model that says this is what fraud looks like that banks use to sort of identify fraud. That model is held at a server. And that model can be delivered to each individual bank who can update the model with stuff they've seen at their bank. Fraud that isn't necessarily represented appropriately or with enough fidelity in the model. 
The bank doesn't want to send that new model unencrypted back to the server because it tells someone who can look at it, here's the kind of fraud that's been happening at that particular bank. And that is not something the bank wants you to know. So what the bank does is they encrypt this new model before they send it back to the server. And the server obtains all these encrypted models from all the different banks and is able to create a new model that incorporates all the new learning from all those different models and then distribute the new model to everybody. So no individual bank data is compromised in the building of the new model. If you want to hear more about this, there is a Chalk Talk on this actually today at 5 with um, two of my teammates, Eric and Jonathan. Um, and they will tell you way more than I told you about this topic and explain to you how it works and the subtleties. So I really encourage you, if you want to learn more, to please go to this talk. OK, next topic, AWS Lib Crypto and FIPS. A few years ago, we decided that customers would benefit if we built our own cryptographic library, managed it ourselves, and optimized it for AWS environments. The thing I'd have flashing on this slide, if I could, is that our FIPS is always current. And so what do I mean by that? NIST, who we talked about a little bit before, the National Institute of Tan Standards and Technology, has something called FIPS, the Federal Information Processing Standard. And this is, a, this is a set, like a booklet of standards that says, here's how government data should be protected. FIPS 140 is a specific government standard that talks about how cryptography should be implemented and used. What happens when it comes to FIPS 140 is you take your crypto module and you take it to a lab that is certified by NIST as a, being a lab that can test this module. And the module is tested. It's in, they ensure that the algorithms are appropriately implemented. They make sure the whole thing is right. And then they give you something called a FIPS certificate. And now you have an actual certified crypto module. One of the things we wanted to do was build something that we could have certified and validated cryptography by NIST and that we would keep it always current. As we make changes, we will have one version that's validated and another version going through. So that was the plan. Other plans, we wanted to make sure that our performance exceeds OpenSSL. OpenSSL is sort of the primary open source crypto library um, used on the internet today. We're hoping to give them a run for their money. We've done formal verification on all of the algorithms in AWS Lib Crypto to ensure that they are completely right. And every time a change is made, the formal proof is run again to make sure that we didn't change anything. As we're improving this library, we actually are giving back to the open source community our improvements. So AWS LC is a fork of boring SSL. And when we make improvements, we offer them back to boring. We let them know, hey, we did these changes. We made this, these things better. You want them? And then the last big bullet, APIs are maintained to be the same as OpenSSL as much as possible. That way, people who are using OpenSSL now can easily switch to AWS Lib Crypto. So this is sort of a picture. AWS Lib Crypto is the stuff in the purple. A cryptographic library sort of sits on an operating system and handles all the basic functions that you'd expect from a, from a cryptographic library or module. And it gives those functions up to things that implement, say, MacSec or TLS or IPSec. So a module sits below. It's 
made specifically for operating systems, so we try to optimize it for the operating system and the platform that it's running on. Um, for example, LibCrypto has been optimized for Intel and for ARM. And we drew our FIPS boundary around the cryptographic primitives because that's what NIST wants to look at and make sure is always valid. And the other thing that's really great about controlling our own cryptographic library is post-quantum. We put those post-quantum algorithms in to the crypto library, so they're all there and ready to be deployed. And we delivered. We made it faster, as you can see. For the elliptic curve algorithms and for AES, it's a heck of a lot faster than OpenSSL. We've outperformed OpenSSL on all the, all the important things. And if you look at that bottom, that's actually boring SSL saying thank you very much and taking a pull of some of our improvements back into their library. There's a breakout session on this one, too. Andrew Hopkins is here. Um, he's going to be giving a talk in the Turquoise Theater at 2 p.m., explaining more about AWS LibCrypto than I could possibly tell you. So I encourage you, if you want to learn more about LibCrypto and FIPS, that's the place to be, 2 o'clock with Andrew. OK, final topic. Transport layer security. I talked a little bit in the beginning about TLS and transport layer security. It's the workhorse of how we encrypt our data today. You got a client, you got a server, and there's a protocol that makes sure the data is authenticated and encrypted between the two sites, client and server. We have our own suite of open source libraries that do transport layer encryption. So we have our own TLS implementation that's open source and available on GitHub. You can have a look at it. And just like everything else we do, we made sure that this was secure. We've tested it. We've done formal verification on it. And we've also optimized it for the environment that it's in. So we have ensured that this particular set of TLS functions is completely right, completely fast, and completely secure. The next slide I'm going to talk about S2N Quick, which is our, one of our newest protocol offerings, which I think is going to be a big deal. And we also have a big number library available in our open source S2N for those of you who love to do big number arithmetic. Just now, one of our newer offerings in this space is S2N Quick. TLS has been the workhorse for years and years and years when it comes to transport layer security. Everybody uses TLS. You see the little lock icon on your browser and you're happy. But TLS was probably not adopted considering all of the problems that all of the network conditions that are going on today. TLS has a few, I'm not going to say flaws because it's been great. TLS has made the internet explode. TLS is an awesome protocol. I don't want to make fun of poor TLS. But TLS was based on sort of a lower expectation of latency, a lower expectation of, of the kind of performance we're demanding out of networks today. Whereas QUIC is way, way faster. QUIC has fewer round trips. So when you want to establish a connection, you don't have to make as many round trips of the conversation that you have with TLS. Where first, you have to establish the connection, and then you have to have a whole chat about your crypto. QUIC mushes it all together and makes it possible for you to negotiate a session at the same time you're sort of setting up your connection. Quick has 
um, congestion controller function, which I'm not going to explain very well. Essentially, this is another problem where you had to look at the traffic the way it moves today, and you say to yourself, hey, you know, I'm getting some drop packets, and TLS doesn't necessarily respond very well to that. Um, I've got lossy networks. I'm switching from one network to another. TLS says, hey, let's renegotiate the whole session. Quick doesn't do any of that. Quick has quick session renegotiations. It looks at the congestion on the network and paces itself appropriately. So Quick is kind of a brand new protocol just recently released, and we jumped right on it because we know this is going to be big. While we were doing it, we made sure that there was a PQ, hybrid key exchange, available in, in Quick from the very beginning. So you can do post-quantum with Quick. We did the same thing we do with everything. We made sure it was verified correct. We ran lots and lots of fuzzing as well, lots of testing. And we actually spent a great deal of time reading the RFCs, which are the internet drafts, to make sure that ours was completely compliant with the RFCs. And we've done interoperability testing with all the other Quick libraries out there to make sure that we've got it right and that we're interoperable with every other Quick library. So I don't like to make predictions because I hate being wrong, but I think Quick's going to be big. I do believe that Quick is going to quickly outpace the TLS market share and take over the network. Unfortunately, I was going to say, and I really encourage you to go to this breakout session, but you're going to need a Wayback Machine. It was this morning at 9.30. So it was an excellent session. I really enjoyed it. Um, Cameron and Wesley did a great job. And if you want to know more about Quick, Cameron and Wesley are here, um, present at Reinforce. And so just reach out to me. I'll get you an introduction. They'll tell you all the stuff that I can't tell you about Quick. All right, we're in the recap. What we covered, one, AWS really, really cares about looking around corners and being ahead of things for you so you don't have to worry about it. And post-quantum cryptography is one of those things we have been working on for years. And we already have some implementations ready for you to test. So if you want to take post-quantum crypto out for a whirl, we can help you. Cryptographic computing, the third leg of the data protection stool. Can we indeed always have data encryption even when it's in use and still gain value from that data? which allows us to look at more and more sensitive data and still get value from it without feeling queasy or at risk. FIPS, the Federal Information Processing Standard is vital for US government and Canadian customers, and it's also vital for many, many banks. So we want to make sure that we have our FIPS story straight, consistent, and constantly right. So AWS Lib Crypto will be the FIPS solution, and we're going to make sure that it's all ready and always perfectly verified so you can use it. And then fourth, S2N Quick, our newest offering in the transport layer security space, which we think is going to be huge. I hope you have learned from this, um, and I hope this has been useful. And the main thing I'm, I'm trying to um, impress upon you is how much we care about your data, and we care about the privacy of your data. So thank you very much. <clears throat>